Peace and all God's blessings be with you. I welcome you to Reflections, a show that asks if people can see God in your reflection and how scripture relates to us today. I am Father Bob Janine, the pastor of Mission St. Sergius and Bacchus, mission of the Independent Catholic Church of the Americas and the Franciscans of Joy of the Gospel. I am also the chancellor of the New England Diocese of the Church, whose offices and our mission offices are located at St. Joseph Cupertino Parish, 742 Rock Street in Fall River, Massachusetts. We also have a parish down in West Warwick, Rhode Island, St. Therese Parish on West Main Street, 1500 West Main Street, and another parish, St. Augustine by the Sea, down in New London, Connecticut. We also have outreach ministries to nursing homes, hospices, hospitals, and shut-ins in Franklin, Fall River, Milford, Walpole, Seekonk, and many other towns within Massachusetts, as well as Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Vermont. This week, I have chosen to write my reflections on the encyclicals by Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis regarding love and how love is only truly exemplified by action. I entitled this reflection, Truth in Love, or Caritas in Verite. At an audience before the wives of some of the world's presidents and prime ministers in Italy, for a group of eight meeting, and following up with my own views, not only on the encyclical, but on who and how true love is the only answer to the world's problems. That was what Pope Benedict introduced his talk and explained how true love, true love, is the only way. The Bishop of Rome noted that the inspiration for his encyclical, Caritas in Verite, is a passage from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 15. <coughs> in which the apostle speaks of acting according to truth in charity. Truth in charity. Think about that. Truth in charity. Caritas in verite. Rather than living the truth in love, we should grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Grow into him who is the head, Christ. Now you'll find these words in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 15. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI acknowledged that he did not pretend to offer technical solutions to social problems but that the encyclical, quote, focuses on the principles and technical solutions of indispensable for human development. Again, focuses on the principles indispensable for human development. Most important among these is human life itself. You know, recently we've been getting news all the time, almost daily, that some radical group has kidnapped a Christian somewhere or slaughtered or killed them just because they were Christians. And yet, human life, human life is so indispensable. We need to try to make sure that it is respected in every way, shape, and manner. 
Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI gave particular attention to the, as he called it, scandal of world hunger, noting how Caritas and Verite calls for decisive action to promote food security and agricultural development, as well as respect for the environment and for the rule of law. Now, our current Pope, Francis, has had the following to say about poverty in the world. And I'm going to read you what he said. To love God and neighbor is not something abstract, but profoundly concrete. It means seeing in every person and face of the Lord to be served, to serve him concretely, and you are, dear brothers and sisters, in the face of Jesus. If you do that, to love God and neighbor is not something abstract, but profoundly concrete. It means seeing in every person and face the Lord that needs to be served and to serve him concretely. When you do this, my dear brothers and sisters, you are doing it as we've been told unto Christ himself. When we read Paul's letter to the Ephesians in its entirety, we find it also points out the diversity of God's creation with these words. God chose some of us to be apostles, some prophets, some missionaries, some pastors, and some teachers, so that his people would learn to serve and his body would grow strong. We must stop acting like children. We must not let deceitful people trick us by their false teachings, which are like winds that toss us around from place to place. Love should always make us tell the truth. Christ holds it together and makes all of its parts work perfectly as it grows and becomes strong because of love, as a follower of the Lord. And this is St. Paul talking. As the follower of the Lord, I order you to stop living like stupid, godless people. Their minds are in the dark, and they are stubborn and ignorant and have missed out on the life that comes from God. They no longer have any feelings about what is right, and they are so greedy. Stop being bitter and angry and mad at others. Don't yell at one another and curse each other or even be rude to each other. Instead, be kind and merciful. Forgive others just as God forgave you because of Christ. Those are powerful words. Powerful words. And they come from St. Paul. And sad thing is, it's almost like he's talking to us today. People are so greedy. They have no respect. They're constantly insulting and badgering. And just it, 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 it's just unbelievable some of the things that we see and hear on the news. And, and on Facebook, it's sometimes even worse. Now, obviously, again, from those words, in St. Paul's time, people were being self-centered and disposed to greed, often forgetting the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which instruct us, by the way, to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, harbor the homeless, visit the sick, ransom the captive, and bury the dead, to instruct the ignorant, counsel those in doubt, admonish sinners, bear wrongs patiently, to forgive offenses willingly, to comfort the afflicted, and to pray for the living and the dead. That's it, folks. That's what it's about. That's what it's all about. Nothing more. Now, I don't know. Maybe you didn't hear each of them. 
So I'm going to very slowly reread them to you. If we are to follow, be true followers of Christ, this is what we need to do. We need to, number one, feed the hungry. It is unbelievable that in the richest country in the world, people are going without adequate food. And Christ, we've been instructed, we need to feed the hungry. Give drink to the thirsty. We've been wasting our resource of water, pure, good, clean water. And without water, we're going to die. We're going to dry up. So we need to feed the hungry, number one. Give drink to the thirsty. We need to clothe the naked. I'll bet you anything that if you go to your closet, you've got clothes in there that you haven't worn in two, three, five years. Somebody can get benefit from them. If they're the old-fashioned, the people who don't have adequate clothing don't care if it's the latest fashion. So donate that clothing to a shelter, to a homeless shelter, to a battered woman's shelter. They can use it. They can also use linens for beds and towels and all the things that you probably have an excess. Or, oh, well, these aren't quite as sharp as the, I'd like them. Or, oh, they don't go with my new color scheme. Well, don't throw them away. Donate them to somebody that can get use out of them. Then, the next one. Number four, harbor the homeless. There are so many homeless people on the streets of every city and town, even some of the richest towns in the United States. We need to find ways of sheltering them or harboring them. Another next, visit the sick. Our ministry is reaching out to nursing homes and sadly, and I've told you this story before, sadly, I have gone to nursing homes and had the people there ask me to pray that their child would come and visit them. And I thought, well, maybe this person forgets. So I asked a nurse. Sure enough, the person was put in there two years ago and hasn't had a visitor since. And people in the hospitals, do you know what happens when I go into a hospital and sometimes I'll bring in a, a very small floral, artificial floral arrangement that I put together. And I'll bring it in and just to say hello to them, maybe bring them Eucharist if they're Catholic, maybe say a prayer with them, give them a blessing, and the smiles on their faces that somebody came to see them. Well, that's what we were told to do, visit the sick. So, here we have, again, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, harbor the homeless, visit the sick, ransom the captive. This is very important in this day and age. Some of the most extreme so-called Islamic radicals are taking prisoners for ransom. And if they don't get it, they kill them. In fact, we've had more martyrs in this modern day than they had in the entire Roman persecutions of the early church. The next one, after ransoming the captive, is bury the dead. Make sure that we take and give people a proper send-off and rejoice in their life. And then, 
We have instruct the ignorant. We're called to let people know the good news of salvation, to spread the joy of the gospel, the truth, the truth that God is love, Deus caritas est. That's what we're all about here. And counsel those in doubt. You know, people will say to me, well, what makes you think that there's a God? I look around and I can't, I can't imagine how without a God, without a God that created everything and keeps everything sort of in balance, and the beauty, the beauty of a rainbow that only God can paint, or nature. You know, God has been called many things. Some people call God Mother Nature. And God is both mother and father. So how can one doubt some of the greatest philosophers and scientists have all come to the conclusion that there is a supreme being, a supreme power that seems to control everything. To admonish sinners, it's our duty to let people know when they are doing something that they shouldn't do. To bear wrongs patiently. Now that's a tough one. That, I have to admit, is a very tough one. To bear wrongs patiently. When somebody hurts you, it's awfully difficult not to get angry. And being Italian, my Italian temper sometimes will flare up. And then I have to regret and I have to say, oh, mea cupola, mea cupola, mea maxima cupola. God forgive me for losing my temper. But to bear wrongs patiently. We're not perfect, neither is anybody else perfect. So people will make mistakes. People will hurt us, either sometimes intentionally and other times not. We need to try to bear them and not retaliate. And then forgive offenses willingly. That's even tougher. When somebody does something that hurts you, say somebody steals from you, it's awfully difficult to turn around and say, okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. But remember, Christ forgave those who put him to death. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So if we're going to try to emulate Christ, we have to be Christ-like and forgive people who commit offenses against us. And comfort the afflicted. Oh, comfort the afflicted and pray for the living and the dead. It's our duty, it's our responsibility when people are down and sick to try to find ways to bring them comfort. Maybe it's to bring them a thing of chicken soup or maybe it's just to go and visit them and bring them a nice, pretty floral arrangement. Whatever. That's what Christ wants us to do, to comfort the afflicted. In our world today, I believe that we, whom God has called to be his servants here on earth, must remind those we serve of their responsibilities as children of God. It's not only the priest, the nuns, the deacons, the bishops, the cardinals that are required to do these things. It's every baptized person. Deus caritas est. God is love. Pure love. Pure the greatest kind of love, a love that knows 
no anger, no jealousy, no hate, a love that is forgiving, compassionate, and merciful. Love is the key that opens up the door to a better world. Love of self as God created you. Love of your neighbors, friends, and even enemies as Christ pointed out when he taught. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's found in Matthew 5, verse 44. Throughout all of Scripture, week after week, I've mentioned and commented and told you where and the various times in Scripture where we talk about love. A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. John 13, verse 34. But I tell you, those who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Luke 6, verses 27 and 28. All the way through Scripture, we are reminded of God's love. Pope Benedict reminded us in his encyclical, Deus Caritas Es, and in the encyclical Caritas in Verite, and in his encyclical, Laudate Si, or Praise Be to You, on the environment, Pope Francis reminds us that our lack of care for the environment causes deep divisions between the rich and the poor, with the poor taking the brunt of a problem. The brunt of the problem. The poor are always the ones who are hurting. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. In the ninth letter, chapter of his second letter to the Church of Corinth, the Apostle Paul is advocating for the poor and recounting the necessity of mutual love, understanding, and action. He urges the church community in Corinth to share their abundance with fellow believers in need, and specifically with the struggling Christian community in Jerusalem. We're told in Scripture that we're supposed to tithe or give 10% of the gifts that we receive, 10% of our salaries or our incomes or whatever, back to God. And that tithing is what supports ministries like our own. I could not do the work I do if it weren't for the donations that pay the bills. Because the people in the nursing homes, the hospices, the hospitals, and the shut-ins, some of them are living on less than $1,000 a month. They can't afford to support the ministry. So we have to rely on outsiders. That's how churches exist. And that's what Paul told the people of Corinth to do. And Pope Francis' sentiments to the Corinthian, to echoes those sentiments of Pope Paul or St. Paul to the Corinthians when it sa he says, it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. Fair balance. We do not have a fair balance in our world today. We have a huge, tremendous imbalance. About 1% of the population have all the money in the world. 
and 35, 40% of the population are hungry and cannot keep up with things. The bottom line is that if we all begin to practice loving one another as Christ loved us and realize that love is not just carnal but spiritual and requires hard work to become a reality, we can change the world. I remember how the flower children of the 60s were disparaged and ridiculed because they attempted to promote the way, this way of life. But then they went astray. Not only they started out right, but then they got diverted. And then it became free love. And then it became, in many cases, sometimes orgiistic love. Carnal orgiistic love. That is not love. Yes, there can be a carnal aspect to love between two people. But that's not what it's for. It's not for our personal self-satisfaction and uh, pleasure. That carnal love is a means of expressing our committed love to another individual, committed, monogamous love to another individual. 